Greetings and welcome to the Evangelist Collaborative, which is a place in the space for those who love the Lord and want to make Him known, get inspired, get equipped, get educated, so they can share the great news about Jesus. And so today I have on the show someone special that I met back at SOE, so I'd like to welcome Jake. Good to see you, buddy. You too, brother. Thanks for having me, man. Awesome. So we met back at the beginning of the year at SOE, and it was quite a significant moment not only for just you but for me as well but um we met there briefly and you know we just got chatting and um, there was just something about your life that i just wanted to connect with and so again i I appreciate you jumping on today but before we jump into what soe meant for you why don't you just take us back and share your faith journey with us well i i gave my life to the lord right before i turned seven years old i was at this like it was a country church out in kansas which is in the central part of the United States, um, very flat and unimpressive. And I was, uh, we were at this, this, I was in this kids' church program, and they got done with this puppet show. And uh, they asked you, who wants to give their life to the Lord? And six-year-old me stood up, and I went marching down the, uh, marching down to the front, and I got saved because of puppets. <laughs> they work, man. I have a soft spot in my heart for kids' church, kids' ministry, one hundred percent. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So. You know, that experience obviously changed your world. So kind of talk us through the, the years following after that, how that impacted you through being a teenager, being an adult. So what did that mean for you? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, <clears throat> it, was, it was kind of, it feels kind of silly to say now, um, but I was like obsessed with the Lord after that puppet show, man. Like my, I was really young, but I had this like comic strip Bible and I took it with me everywhere. Like I slept with it. I took it to school with me. I wanted everybody to see my comic Bible, you know? And then I started like, it was like recess evangelism. Like I started this club, I called it God's army. And like, you could only be a part of it if you loved Jesus and were nice to people. <laughs> it sounds so silly, you know, but, um, but it was amazing to see how like now looking back on on my life over the years you know that was just when i was seven but then in high school i I played football uh and american football not nearly as manly as rugby i'll also say that too i got saved after a puppet show and i didn't play a manly sport but um but yeah so i when i got to high school um played football and all that and then I started like this Bible study thing, like in my school. I just, I don't know, I called it Fishers of Men of all things. And it ended up being a really cool thing. A bunch of faculty and students signed up for it and stuff saying that they'd, you know, that they'd go to it or something. Went to college to play football. And then God's like, hey, I want to use you in something bigger than football. And so then I, I quit football and then went into ministry and found myself in uh now i'm in rice lake wisconsin which is like just south of canada so making that transition from leaving a passion that you were so passionate about and you felt a calling of god on your life to move into that to going into full-time ministry talk to us about that well it was um it was tough you know i loved sports you played sports too i think right so you know um how how into it you can be it can kind of be your world you know um but it actually it it was hard but it wasn't hard you know um but i I remember actually like i remember going out of football and into a campus ministry that was currently doing doing really well and they were having a great impact on the campus and stuff and somehow i ended up in like the evangelism department of some kind you know so like (laughs) We were, I don't know, it's just amazing how God, like, does that, you know? I, I just, I don't know, it just blows my mind. But, but yeah, it was kind of, it was kind of hard, but it was also, um, it also wasn't. It's kind of crazy. So the transition from sport into ministry, that transition period was kind of smooth for you. You felt like, well, there wasn't really anything holding me back or pulling me back into that. You kind of felt, yeah, it's a new season. I'm moving into something new and fresh. I'm moving into full-time ministry. So what happened there once you were, once you were in full-time ministry? Um, well, that was um, – because I, I graduated in like three and a half years, so it was a pretty short-lived college experience. 
you know, it was just like a year in football is my freshman year. And then that's when I quit that and got into campus ministry. And so even that was only for about, you know, maybe two years or so. Um, but then when God called me into full-time ministry, which is where I am right now, I've been at the same church ever since, um, in the same, involved the same ministry, but that's changed my life. And I'm just so thankful. Um, when, um, when I was in college, I, after I graduated, I had like numerous opportunities. Um, one of which was fairly lucrative, like financially, it was really, really nice. Um, and then there were a couple other ones that were abroad outside of the country that were kind of flashy and looked, sounded fun. Um, but then there was this one, which is here where I am now in Rice Lake, Wisconsin, bro, there's like 8,000 people here, first of all. And so it's really small. It's freezing. It gets 40 below zero. That's like Celsius. Yeah. Penguins should live here. It's horrible. I don't know where they are or yeah, it's crazy. But, um, so I knew like out of all the opportunities, I knew which one I didn't want to pick, you know? <laughs> And I went into my, my room, my bedroom, and I shut the door and I turned on some worship music and I was, I was just seeking the Lord, like, what do I do, you know? And I experienced the very first vision I've ever experienced in my life. When usually when people talk about visions, I think, I used to think they were, they just had too much pizza or something weird happened. You know, I don't know. I didn't believe them. But I experienced the first vision of my life with the Lord and it was just so profound and precious and it ultimately led me to Rice Lake, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, where I am now. And it's been a beautiful thing, man, because when I came here, they, they actually brought me here to start a young adult ministry. And they only had one young adult in the church in an 8,000 population town. You know, so really, the, the, I guess you could say the odds were stacked against me in the natural, right? Or against the church in the natural. Um, but my pastors started just like, they, just, they believed in me and they equipped me and um cheered me on and everything and it's been it's been a few years now and we uh we've got we've got a few cell groups now we've got about probably 50 young adults that identify with the church well more than 50 but 50 that are like actively involved um in the church and so it's just been an amazing amazing journey man way better than football ever was and even better than football is now it's just wow. been fantastic so let, let's fast forward now to the school of evangelism which by the way is a great um thing to be a part of obviously you have to be invited in to come to the cfan school of evangelism but kind of talk to us about the times leading into school of evangelism how did you ever come to know about it what was the process there for you going going into school of evangelism so why don't you just share with us um about that that process yeah, man. Um, I are you familiar with Bobby Connor? Uh, um, Bobby, no. he's a okay, he's he's a prophetic voice um, internationally speaking. You know Bob Jones at all? Okay, so Bobby Connor was his a spiritual son. Um, so he he like jumped in the place of of Bob Jones as I understand it. Um, but anyway, he's a really good friend of our house and our pastors. And as he comes once a year and. He looked at me and he said, number one call is evangelism. And it like put words to my life story. You know, I was like, oh my gosh, that makes a lot of sense now. And, and then um, I think I was on YouTube actually. And I saw a CFAN panel. So it was like Daniel Kalenda, um, Michael Culianos, Todd White, Nathan Morris, Peter Vandenberg, and all those guys were on the panel. And I thought, what is this SOE? And it said school of evangelism. And I'm like, well, one plus one equals two. I think I should, I got to look into this thing, you know? And, um, and so I looked into it and I thought, man, there's no way I'll ever be a part of that. That's like, it's beyond me, you know? Um, but then months later, I was in prayer one morning and the Lord said, I swear, it was like a bolt of thunder in my room. And he said, go apply for the school of evangelism now. I'm like, but Lord, I'm with you right now. You know, this is just our time. And he said, no, go now. And so I got up and I ran over to my computer and I, and I sent in an application. And it was, it was just days later that I got an acceptance um, in, my, in my inbox. And uh, I was just shocked and, and pumped, man. It was, it was a really cool, cool experience that way. And so you were released by your pastors to, go, to move into that and to go into that school. Um, 
So why don't we just talk a little bit about what the school of evangelism did to you? Like, what was that experience like for you? Oh, bro. <laughs> it was, uh, well, I mean, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was a monument in my life that I'll always look back on and remember what the Lord did, not just in my life, but in your life and, and everybody that was there. Um, but I think, gosh, the best way to describe it, I think, is when, when I came home. And maybe, I think, I'm sure everybody experienced the same thing. But as soon as I was on my way home, I was like, I just felt like I was vibrating, bro. Like, just the glory of God, you know, and just, just fantastic. And I think you and I were talking shortly after, I think it was just a few days after we just reached out and we're talking quick. And, and I was telling you, I was like, dude, like I get these waves where I just like start crying. It was like for seven days, you know, it was, it was, it was beautiful and it's been beautiful. And, um, and our church actually, I preached the same night that I got back. So we, I got up early. I'm sure you did too, going to New Zealand, man. But um, got up really early, came came back home. We had to go to like a baby reveal, like as soon as I flew in. And then we got had to go to the church really quick. And then I preached. And I think I told you this too, but there was such a dramatic response where the altars were flooded. I mean, we all just felt this powerful conviction of the Lord in a, in a great way. It was die to yourself and and really live in Christ completely, you know, like, what are we doing chasing so many other things instead of Jesus, you know, and, and from that place on, our church really, you know, was experiencing this revival, like atmosphere in incredible ways. In fact, there was one Sunday, just right before the coronavirus hit, that this one man came into the church building. And he was, I mean, he's, he's a big, he's like you, okay? He's, he's just, he's jacked he's he's huge he's like got this beard that just i don't know he's awesome awesome guy uh, but he hadn't been in the church for quite some time i hadn't seen him in what felt like a year or more but he came in really really tough um and as we're worshiping all of a sudden i hear somebody just kind of crying but it wasn't it was like a man crying and it just kind of caught my attention so in worship i looked over and he was at the altar, completely unprovoked, uninvited. Of course, everyone's invited, but nobody was like, come forward or anything. He just helped himself, walked right up to the altar. And that's pretty common for people in our church, but not for him. He just came walking right up to the altar, was on his face, just weeping and weeping and weeping. And, and I looked at my pastor. I said, Pastor, that's what this thing's all about right there. That is just amazing. So. Um, talk about some of the memorable moments for you. What what did they look like? And it, may, it might have been a speaker. It might have been um, through that prayer tunnel. Man, <laughs> that's crazy. Um, yeah. But what was a memorable moment for you? Man, that is such a good and very unfair question, bro. Why do you have to ask me that question? <laughs> Obviously, the whole thing was fantastic. There isn't a single thing. Like even like I was in Rob Angie's breakout session on excellence and i don't know if you listened to that audio yet or not but it it was probably the least like spiritual breakout or lesson of the whole week but it was so great so i mean everything was wonderful about the everything was wonderful even the food right yeah <laughs> <laughs> but i think um honestly daniel kalenda's message on day two when he pulled up the videos of Reinhard Bonnke and he was talking about, you know, Esther and, and, and Esau despising his birthright and everything. I've listened to, I've re-listened to that message. I, I can't even count how many times I was listening, listening to it this morning while I was working out the whole, the principle of like, when, when God told Reinhardt and Catherine Coleman that, the Lord said, if you drop the vision I gave you for a blood-washed Africa, I will have to drop you and give it to someone else that will do something with it. And I think we all in the room felt like we just got blasted with like, you know, this spear to our hearts. And then as, as evangelist Daniel Kalenda continued to, to, to expound on that, that absolutely wrecked me, man, talking about how, yes, we don't, we, we can't love our families 
or excuse me, we can't sacrifice our families on the altar of ministry. Of course not. But at the same time, we can't love our family more than Jesus himself and finding that, that balance, you know? And if, so that was, for me, that was just, it's been a profound deposit in my spirit. The prayer tunnel, um, it was like leading the sheep to the slaughter in that room. It was awesome. Um, I mean that in a, in a very good way. And of course, one-on-one -on -one time with the speakers, that was really, really valuable too. But now it's your turn. We have You've talked briefly about how the school has really impacted your life while you are at the school and you talk briefly about how it's impacted your world in terms of ministry but what do you feel the lord is stirring in your heart for this next season of your life wow great question big question honestly we we have been feeling you know um i don't know if you saw the whole the hype about bob jones's prophecy of revival when the chiefs win the super bowl i don't know if you saw that all, at all yeah, I saw that briefly, and, and that was a pretty powerful moment. I think a lot of people were talking about it here. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm from Kansas City. I was born there. So I'm a huge Chiefs fan and everything. And obviously, having played football, it's a soft spot for me. But when that happened, that happened shortly after the School of Evangelism. So the church internationally in the charismatic movement, when we heard that prophecy from Bob Jones, and it happened, and then especially those of us, I wonder if, Anybody else in the school of, of evangelism paired those two together, but you know the 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 billion soul harvest and everything, you know like now is the time for it. And then instantly COVID nineteen happens. It's just like whoa, like oh man, the devil, you know he's a thief. Yeah. He's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. But of course, as Reinhardt said in his video, no one can thwart the plans of God. No devil in hell, no human on earth, nobody can stop him. His his plan and purpose is a freight train. Yeah. And so we, uh, like what Daniel said, he's like, I'm more of a practical guy. He's like, how, how can we see a billion people saved? And so he started explaining his vision for that. And so for us, my wife and I, we're thinking like, okay, what can we do in Rice Lake? Our pastors, we're thinking, what can we do in Rice Lake and in, in our sphere of influence to contribute to so this good. billion soul harvest? And so there are two campuses in our city here. Um, they're both they're both fairly small um, and they're just, they've, they've been really, really great to, to build relationships with the people and the faculty and stuff. But we finally, and here, probably everywhere, campuses in the United States are fairly liberal, um, not very open to the, to the gospel, you know. Um, I don't know if they're like that in New Zealand or not, but they, they are here. And so, We've been just slowly developing relationship over the past six years or so. And now we finally, we had this idea, our ministry is called Relay, like a relay race and track. And we're going to be, we actually had it scheduled for April 23rd to do a relay night on campus in their auditorium. Um, and we were just going to preach the gospel. We're going to have worship, preach the gospel, pray for the sick, and give people an opportunity to give their lives to the Lord. And we were jacked about it. But then COVID happened. And the campus actually told us, dude, this is so cool. We sent an email and we're like, hey, this is what we want to do. We we're very forthcoming about it. And they said, we would love for you to come and do your relay nights on our campus. And we're like, yes, we're, we're <laughs> doing it. And so we scheduled it. COVID happened. So what we feel in our spirits for this next season is, is actually like, doing that but on a whole new level of intensity where it's like the enemy thought he could hold us back but um that, that ain't gonna work too good come on dude i came home and as soon as i as soon as i got home i actually like I, we, we're gonna be married it'll be three years in august so we're just babes that's why at lunch when we first met i was asking you like bro tell me about marriage you know what are some points that you have you know and um and that was a great conversation, by the way. But when I came home, it's, it's, I loved my wife before I went to SOE, no doubt about it, of course. But when I came home, it's like I, I, I don't know how to explain it, but I just, like, my, it's like I valued her even more when I came home and like, I wanted to lead her even better when I came home. I wanted to be a better husband. I wanted to love her in a way that she receives 
love. And I just, I just wanted to, I just wanted to be a better husband, you know, and, and we don't have kids or anything. We have a golden retriever and a really overweight cat. So like the, I mean, we just, I luckily, you know, I don't, yeah. Trying to get the cat on a diet and stuff. But other than that, just trying to focus on, um, you know, just loving my wife the best I can and being the man of God that, that I'm called to be, that we're called to be, you know? So good, man. So good. I mean, getting it right at home is so important, right? Um, I'd love for you to pray and just close off in prayer. Um, some of the, the key themes that we talked about um, was just about coming back to, to what's important, you know, and coming back to Jesus, making it all about him, not about us. You know, the Bible says that if anyone wants to follow me, he must first deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And so, you know, um, I really love for you to pray into that, particularly for, for those who are listening, who, um, who kind of get a sense that they want to follow the Lord, but there are still some things that they're holding on to. Mm-hmm. There are still some things that are kind of pulling them back. Maybe it's friends, maybe it's a passion that's not unsan- that's not sanctified to the Lord. Um, so I would really love for you to pray into that because you came out of that whole thing, you know, and for you, that transition was pretty smooth, but uh, it was a natural progression to go from where you were to where you are today. So, but for others, it may not be as smooth. It may be a bit of a, a, um, a challenge for them. So I'd love for you to pray into that. Yeah, man, I'd love to, I'd love to. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for the truth of the gospel. It's, it's the best thing that's ever happened to us is you. And Lord, I just pray right now for anybody that's listening who does feel a tension or is maybe getting or finds themselves sidetracked into things that are fleeting, into things that aren't bringing them the life that maybe they're looking for. Even for me, Lord, I, I remember I was I was caught up in, I've been caught up in so many things that are actually good things, but they distracted me from you, who, who is the main thing. And so, Lord, I just pray that, that you, would, you would capture the hearts of your children, Lord, especially those who are watching and listening to this right now. Lord, when we see how good you are, everything else kind of loses its flavor. And so, Lord, I just pray, we pray that every single person listening to this, and even, man, even those who are not, Lord, the evangelists who are currently dormant, Lord, we just pray that they would taste and see your goodness right now, wherever they are, whether they're at work or at home, whatever they're doing, Lord, may they experience your goodness and see how amazing you are. And in that place, in that revelation, Lord, I thank you that the the craving for other things will just die and just fade away because nothing compares to you. Nothing even comes close. So Lord, I thank you for them. And I thank you for the the evangelists that are going to come roaring out of their their current situations and see many, many, many saved. Lord, we thank you so much for them. And Lord, I just bless the evangelist collective, this, this amazing collaborative community that my brother has taken the initiative to assemble. It's a beautiful thing. And Lord, I just thank you for all the evangelists that are a part of this. I pray that we would be encouraged. And I even pray for a supernatural creativity in all of our hearts, that we would be, that we, our ears would be open and that our hearts would be open to your creativity on what we can do now in the midst of a pandemic to still preach the gospel and win the lost. And furthermore, creativity on what to do as soon as those gates are open and we can go back out there. But we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your plans. Nothing can stop them. And we're on board with you for those plans. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 I agree. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother, for for jumping on today. Really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day.